Positive, I'm Annie and I am the Proper Stitcher and welcome to episode number 68. If this is your first time joining me, I am so glad you joined us today. This is a channel where I like to talk about cross stitch and quilting and hopefully give you inspiration to fully finish your projects. And if you're returning, thank you so much for your continued support and all of your wonderful well wishes you send my way. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. This episode is going to be very different than my previous episodes. This episode is going to be all about addressing finishing concerns, intimidations, struggles, all of those things. Two episodes ago, I asked you all to share with me what you find the most challenging when it comes to finishing your cross stitch pieces. So we are going to address as many of those concerns today as we can. So this is not my regular Thursday video. I am recording on a Friday and I will return to our regular videos next Thursday where I will show you my whips, my haul, and all of those regular floss tube um, shenanigans. So let's just jump into what we are doing today. So as many of you know, but for those of you who are new, I, um, my philosophy on not only floss tube and on cross stitching on finishing is I would rather have a finished project than a perfect project. And what I mean by that, I feel like I have to explain is I have found through my many years of being around cross stitchers, cross stitching myself, um, just listening to people, talking to people, I have heard and learned that a lot of people really do have a fear of finishing their projects. They worry about them being perfect. They compare them to professional finishers. They compare them to their friends. They just, everybody is their own worst critic. And what I want to do and what I am here to do is hopefully remove that element of fear out of your finishing life and let you just enjoy the process. Let you enjoy not only cross stitching something, but knowing that you will then be able to finish it. You will then be able to have it either on display in your home or to share as a gift with someone. That is my goal. That has been my goal since my very first flash tube that I filmed on April 1st, 2021. I have always said that I would rather have a finished project than a perfect project. So that does not mean I slap a lot of glue and I'm really messy and hurry through things. It just means I don't worry about things being perfect because it is okay if things are not perfect. So let's get started. When I asked that question in my last video, Judy Whitman with JBW Designs, I think had a some wonderful words of wisdom that I wanna share with you all. And this is what she said. Um, Judy said, we all make mistakes but that's okay. We learn each time we try. And that is absolutely correct. It doesn't, I don't like to use the phrase practice makes perfect perfect because again, I'm not worried about things being perfect. I just know that practice makes things easier. It makes things more enjoyable. It makes it better each time you do it so that the next time you go and pull out all of your finishing supplies, you don't dread it. You're not putting it off. And that's what I'm finding a lot is we are dreading the process. So let's not, let's not keep that from doing what we enjoy, or let's not let that keep us from finishing the process. So I do feel that we all have it within us to finish our projects. I understand if you just don't want to do it, but I also know that sometimes it is cost prohibitive to send your items to a professional finisher or framer. So I like to mix up my things and try to finish as much as I can on my own. That does not mean that from time to time I send things to a professional framer or to a professional finisher. It just means I try to limit how often I do that because I'm trying to keep the cost of everything down. So let's jump in, let's address some of these things. And I made a lot of notes. Um, I have a lot of things on my table. Um, this will, we will probably not cover everything because I had almost 700 comments on my last video. So we won't be able to cover everything. A lot of you shared similar um, problems, similar concerns, similar struggles. And so I kind of grouped those all together. So what we might find is after all of this, it might be best for me to do like a live question answer scenario on YouTube. And I am completely okay with doing that. So we will 
um, see how this goes and go from there. It also will open up opportunities for me to then go in and have individual tutorials, whether it be on cutting or pillow tutorials or a sticky board tutorials, you name it. So it's just going to open the door to more of a tutorial playlist, if you will, or a line of things that we're going to do. So like I said, I made a lot of notes. I'm going to reference my notes. This is this is different than our regular episode. So I just want to make sure I don't forget anything. So grab a pen of paper, grab your cross stitch, grab your tea, grab your courage because we can all do this. I know we can. So grab everything you need to get started. Okay, so let me take a sip. I made a list of kind of the common themes and the common um, common concerns that I saw um, in those responses. And so here is the range of things I saw. So um, let's see, I had, so let's just start with the first one. The first one was, um, or one of the um, main things was the cost of supplies to get started. So if you're starting out and you're brand new to um, finishing, and just like when you're brand new to cross stitch, you don't need to buy everything all at once and start all at once. What I would recommend you do, buy your finishing supplies when they're on sale. Um, Hobby Lobby, Michaels, all of these places, Joann's, they have coupons, they offer sales, they have 50% off sales, all of those things. So kind of watch those. They all have apps that you can get on your phone, maybe have some extra discounts that way. So I would recommend you keeping an eye on the sales that are going on in the stores. Um, and spread it out over time. Don't feel like you have to go and buy everything all at once. So say Hobby Lobby or one of these stores, they're having a sale on their adhesives and their sticky board. Let that be a time that you stock up on that. The same goes with when you are looking for ribbons and trims, don't feel like you have to buy them all at once. Buy as you need or, or say, today I'm going to finish some patriotic pieces or I know I have some patriotic pieces I'm going to plan ahead for. Go ahead and plan ahead and buy a couple of different trims or ribbons or bows that you want to use. Don't feel like you have to buy it all at once. And before you realize it, you will start to build up your stash of finishing supplies. So, and work on one season at a time. So like I just mentioned, if you're buying for Halloween, Halloween's coming up or Christmas, go ahead and look ahead and say, all right, this month I'm gonna focus on buying Christmas finishing supplies. And then you're not buying so many things all at once. So that by next year, then you have the next holiday and the next holiday. And then before you know it, you will have a good stash of finishing supplies. Another one that I thought was funny, this one is being in the mood, being in the mood to finish. A lot of you struggle with, I'm just not in the mood to finish. And that is understandable. Just like with our cross stitch, we have to be in the mood to do something or anything we do, we have to be in the mood to do it. So what I would recommend, and I may, I may go back and forth over some of these things because I have a couple of notes everywhere, but what I would recommend is set aside time say okay next Saturday I am going to let that be my finishing day that is a day that I am focusing on finishing a couple of things and don't overwhelm yourself just pick a couple of things that you want to finish don't let that be the day that you go and finish 10 items if you know that you are not going to probably be in the mood to do it or that you're building up your stamina for finishing start off small don't don't try to be a professional finisher in the first day you do this um, and try to, if in a lot of you have said it's not, so the mood kind of falls under an umbrella of, I also don't have a lot of space or I don't have the organization or places to keep everything. So I'm gonna kind of lump all of these together. So if you're not in the mood or if you don't have the space, all of these things, I think it would also be fun to get with a group of friends and um, say today's gonna be finishing day. I have friends that call it craft weekend. They get together, they all have different types of crafts that they like to do. But have a finishing day with friends. If you have other friends that cross stitch, then you can all pull your supplies together. So, you know, my friend um, Kay may have a lot of finishing trim and my friend Kim may have all the boards and things like that. Everybody pull your resources together, share and barter and do things like that. That might also help with the cost. But if you're with a, a group of friends, I think that we get inspiration off of each other. We can bounce ideas off of each other. Um, I know when Gray is here, 
uh, my daughter Gray, I will ask her for her opinion often. Now that she's gone, I I go to my husband and, and Tristan a lot and say, "What do you think? Which color? What do you? What do you?" We all want validation. So if that appeals to you, get together with some friends and make one mess in one place, and you all help clean it up. Because a lot of people said that's the other thing that they didn't like was the mess that it makes. Not all of us have a craft room or a sewing room or a place to spread out. So if you plan on one weekend a month or one day a month or however it works in your schedule, make one mess one time, get all of the things done over a period of time, then clean it all up. Um, I think that that will, that, that helps me too, because I used to not have a sewing room and my dining room became my sewing and my craft room and my finishing room. And I would joke and say, well, I'm glad we don't use the dining room very often because it's now my, my finishing table, but bring it all out at one time, get as much done as you feel like, put it all away and just plan ahead. Then you will hopefully get yourself in the right mindset, the frame of mind, the right mood, all of those things. So, and don't dread it. Um, don't say, oh, I have to finish today. It's not a have to, you don't have to do it, but um, don't, I, when you do a little prep work ahead of time or, or start off small, it won't feel as overwhelming or intimidating and then hopefully won't be as dreadful to you. So that hopefully will help us get in the mood to finish our pieces under the umbrella of organization. So if you don't have a lot of space and you um, don't have a room to spread out in or a closet or anything like that, what I would recommend is in your organization, maybe have one caddy or one container with all of your, your, your cutting and adhesive supplies in one space. So it's, I can grab this and I can now grab my bin of all of my finishing materials. So try to keep it all in one place um, or organize it by season. Say in this box, I'm just gonna have all of my Halloween finishing items. So you just pull that one box out and then you don't have to worry about having stuff everywhere, but it's all condensed. So have your holidays divided, but then also have all your finishing supplies. So really you're just pulling out a couple of boxes. So hopefully that will help with organizational concerns. This one's one of my favorites. And I do, now in this video, I do have some show and tell. Um, it's not gonna be a lot, but I do have some show and tell. So another common, um, comment that I got was choosing finishing fabric. A lot of you struggle with choosing or deciding on fabric. So this, a lot of these are going to fall under the same umbrella. And so if you hear me going back and forth, it's because they, they do, they all fall under the same. I don't know what I want to do or how I want to do it. One of those under that umbrella is choosing your finishing fabric. So this is something that works for me. I have mentioned before, when you are shopping um, in a fabric store, quilt store, buy buy what you like when you see it. Because with fabric, when it goes out, it's gone. You're not going to get it back. So if you see a fabric you like, or if you know I have a lot of patriotic pieces I'm working on that I'm going to need fabric to either make into pillows or to for flat finishes, either bring those items with you to the store to match or just go with it. That's what I do most of the time because I'm stitching so many different things that I don't want to take everything I'm working on to the store. So I just, um, if, if I'm, I am okay with that at this point with things not being so perfect and the colors matching so perfectly that I will buy themes as I see it and then match. So fat quarter bundles are a great way to build up your stash without spending a lot of money. And then when you finish a piece, and you don't want to go to a store, you live too far away, you have a variety to choose from. So I'm going to show you, since I'm talking about patriotic pieces, this is one that I finished. So this is, and, and I'm not going to go through the details of telling you designers and things like that. Those are in all of my previous videos. Everything I have on the table today, I have shared in previous videos. So this is a patriotic piece that I finished myself and everything I'm showing you today, I finished myself. So this is a patriotic piece. I happen to have this, this blue fabric in my stash. So my fabric is organized by either 
holiday. So if it is, it is a true Christmas fabric or a true Halloween fabric, I have it in a stack of Halloween or Christmas fabric. If, and then from there, I have it in colors. So I have all my blues together, all my reds together, all my greens together. So when I go to finish a piece, I pull out the piece. So for instance, I pull out the piece that's not finished and then I pull a stack of fabric. And when I'm doing this, do not overwhelm yourself with choices. If you are a person that gets overwhelmed like I am with too many choices, limit yourself to maybe three or four choices and then pick and pull. So if I hold up these three pieces of fabric, I can now then lay this on top and pick and choose which one I think will go. I don't want to overwhelm myself with too many choices. So looking at it, this has a, a brownish background. I know that this is probably going to be too light. So now I just have two choices. I have this and this. And I really like how, again, this is creamy brown. I like how this blue is more dominant and it really looks like it's going to make it pop on this fabric. That is how the process goes for me. I do not think that um, it needs to be a perfect match. I don't think you need to go and say, okay, this blue and that blue are not the exact same color. I don't think you need to worry yourself with those details. Now that doesn't mean that you want to get something like for red, you don't want to get a blue red and an orange red. That's not what I mean. What I mean is don't worry with things being perfect. When we worry about things being so perfect, that's when we run into all these problems. So don't overwhelm yourself. Pick a couple of things, go from there. And then the same goes with trim. So I knew that this was, um, a lot of you have said, I don't, you know, choosing embellishments is difficult for me. Well, when I did this and I knew I was gonna have the blue background, I pulled my blue trim. And then from there, I decided how I wanted to finish it. Um, do I want it? Did I want rickrack or did I want chenille trim? Well, really what made the decision for me on this is because I wanted something navy blue and this was all I had in my stash. So that is how this little pillow came to be. Um, so choosing fabric, don't, don't overcomplicate it. Don't worry about it being perfect. It's okay if they're coordinating fabrics, but don't worry about it being perfect. So I y'all have heard me talk about, I love the French general fabric, um, Joy Noel, that is out of print it's from four or five years ago well here's what i have left in my stash of that and what i did when i bought it is i bought fat quarter bundles in all of the coordinating pieces so i bought the red i bought the green and then i bought the one with the little holly berries on it I bought the stripes, which you can see I don't use that much of the stripes. I guess it's not, I don't like it as much, but buy some fat quarter bundles. And then when you're, when you go to finish something in that season or in that color category, you already have it. It takes the guesswork out of it for you. If you know that those are coordinating fabrics, you know, they're already going to match if you're blending a couple of different layering pieces that may help you with that process. But we live in a time now where things don't have to be matchy matchy. Take advantage of that. Don't worry about that. So hopefully that addresses fabric. Let me make sure that I um, didn't, didn't leave anything out. Um, choosing your embellishments. So we're kind of touching on that. So let's go with that. Again, start off small and few. Give yourself just a few choices. If you feel comfortable attaching chenille trim, attach chenille trim. If you're ready to start something new, there are so many tutorials on how to attach trim. Try rickrack. Try one new thing at a time. So if you are starting out for the first time finishing, don't overwhelm yourself. Keep it simple and then build on to that. Um, if, if this is the time that you want to learn to attach trim, pick one trim, go from there. Next time you go, pick a different trim and go from there. So start off small, and build up from that. Um, okay, so another one that a lot of you have, I'm kind of all over the place because these comments were, were just across the board, but general fear. A lot of you have fear of messing up your cross-stitch piece. 
um, which is a legitimate concern, I understand. But I am here to show you some boo-boos that I've made. And y'all know I always tell you when I make a mistake because I make them often. But first of all, I don't think you're ever going to just cut down the middle of your cross stitch piece. That would be you not even looking at it at all. And if that's the case, you really shouldn't be operating scissors or a rotary cutter because that's not safe. <laughs> but I don't think any of you will ever come that close to your piece. But if you do, there are ways to fix that and to correct that. So we're going to go over mistakes I've made. I have some pieces here to show you that I have not finished yet. I'm saving these for one of our tutorials and cutting supplies. So there are ways that we can get you prepared so that you have more confidence in your cutting skills. So let me show you the, the too close for comfort cut that I have made on three of my Prairie Schooler Santas. So what happened was I made these three Prairie Schooler Santas into pillows. I had them done. They were sewn, looking pretty good. But in my mind, they weren't perfect. I wanted them cut in a little bit closer. I wanted, I didn't want so much of a margin on my pillow. It was bothering me to the point where I thought I was going to fix it. And what I did is I ended up cutting it too close because I was obsessed with it being perfect. This is not how we want to be. This is why I would rather have a finished project than a perfect project or then it becomes a ruined project. So I learned my lesson not to let things obsess and bother me so much. So this is what I did. I had these made into pillows. I had given myself too much of a margin and by the time I finished the pillow, turned it in, stuffed it, turned it out and stuffed it and did all that, the margin was really bothering me. So I did the lazy thing. Instead of taking it apart with a seam ripper, I just cut the side. And in doing so, I got them all too close to the stitch piece. So that is what happened to these three. And fortunately, I didn't get them any closer than I did, but that is really too close. So, but that's okay. It's not ruined. I haven't ruined my piece. Now, is it is it the right way to do it? Absolutely not, but it's not ruined. So what I've done is I've pulled some Christmas fabrics, some plaids, some little um, woodland seamed Christmassy winter, and I'm gonna play around with these fabrics. But what I can do to fix this mistake, here's another one. This one's really pretty. But what I can do to fix this mistake is I don't have all of my Christmas ornaments out to share with you, but in one of my videos, I showed y'all how to finish the JBW um, ornaments I made last year. And I did a trim around or a seam around the pillow ornament. So you can see a little bit of the backing fabric up front. That is what I'm gonna do with these. I'm gonna do about a quarter of an inch um, or half of an inch, quarter of an inch, trim around these for the front of my pillow. And that's how I'm going to fix not giving myself enough of a seam allowance when I go to turn these pillows in. So that is one way of, of, of me showing you that yes, you can make a mistake when cutting, but there's always a way that we can repair the damage and this is my plan for these pillows. So I'm saving these for a tutorial video for you. Uh, let's talk about cutting supplies. So since we're talking about being afraid of messing up when we cut, because we are going to have to cut these pieces. Um, I'm going to tell you what my grandfather told me when I was growing up, he was a carpenter. And I'm sure you've all heard this, measure twice, cut once. If you need to measure three times, do it. Measure as many times as you need to. Always have pen and paper or pencil and paper by you. Take notes, measure, measure your stitched piece, measure, um, the size you want your piece to be. Measure as much as you can so that when you go to cut, you're making those cuts and you feel good about it. Now, I would recommend that you get really good cutting tools. Not only just cutting tools, like a good rotary color cutter, and make sure your blade is sharpened because that's gonna give you a nice smooth cut make sure you have good rulers and make sure you know how to read the rulers. Vonna Pfeiffer with the Twisted Stitcher is a professional finisher. She has wonderful tutorials on how to use rulers, how to measure, how to make sure that you're cutting exactly where you want to cut. These clear rulers are wonderful because you can see through what you're cutting and you know exactly where you're cutting. 
takes the guesswork out of it. It takes the fear out of it because you're seeing what you're doing. And have a good cutting mat. The, the cutting mat that you see at the quilting stores, it is going to help you line up your rulers and get a straight cut. Learn how to use those. So we will talk about these in other videos that I have coming up. But these are wonderful tools. Just make sure, so when you're adding to your supplies, see when these are on sale. Fat Quarter Shop has um, cutting tools on sales and rulers on sale. Your local quilting stores will have them on sale. The big box quilting stores will have them on sale. Just buy a couple. If you know that you're not gonna make anything bigger than this six and a half by six and a half ruler, go ahead and buy one and keep it in your stash. Sometimes you may need a smaller one and have it ready to go. But just buy one or two rulers, make sure that you have those in your stash and use them. So um, one thing that I have learned or found and I'm going to practice with it is a rotary or a circle cutter. So this will help with all those circles, those round designs that I like to stitch um, that JBW Designs makes. So this is a great tool too. Um, a lot of you have said that you struggle with cutting sticky board, um, understandable, or thicker board if you if you use some sort of card um, board or comic board. I have purchased a guillotine. This is a Swing Line brand guillotine. Um, keep one of these on hand. This takes it. This makes it so much easier for cutting your sticky board. Um, if you don't use sticky board, but you use the comic board, you can use this as well to cut straight lines. I don't trust myself with an X-Acto knife. Um, I just don't trust scoring the, the board enough um, or a straight line enough. You can also go to Hobby Lobby or Michaels, and if you're buying mat board, if you don't want to use sticky board, they'll cut the mat board to any dimension you want. So that takes the guesswork out of you because someone else is cutting it for you. So. Make sure you have good scissors. Make sure you have a good rotary cutter. Make sure you have the right rulers when you're cutting. And um, if you're going to be cutting any sticky board or any board at home, get a guillotine paper cutter. Just be careful using all these things. We don't want any trips to the emergency room. All right, so hopefully that covers fear of cutting. Now, some of us just have plain fear of just starting the process. And again, that goes back to, you've never done it before, you don't feel comfortable doing it. Just remember that it's not fear you, you have as much as it is, you just don't know what to do. You don't feel comfortable doing it because you haven't done it before. So try one finish and work it until you feel like you, you feel good about it, then move on to another type of finish. So if you wanna learn how to do pillows, start doing pillows. Some of you said, I don't have a sewing machine. Well, you, you can even finish pillows by hand stitching. You don't have to have a sewing machine to do that. Um, or if you don't wanna do some uh, pillow finishes and you wanna do boards, watch tutorials, learn how to finish the board. So pick one thing and go from there. Don't feel like you have to do it all. But then that also brought up the question, a lot of you said, I don't even know how I want to finish something. Do I want it to be a pillow? Do I want it to be a, a flat finish on a sticky board on a board? Or do I, what do I want to do with this? Well, only you can answer that question. But what I do is I look in my home and I think, okay, I don't have enough ornaments for my Christmas tree. I'm making ornaments right now. Or I have a lot of countertop space. I want some things for my countertop or I want things in if you have a tiered tray. So you want smaller things to go in your tiered tray, or I want things that are framed or, and, and so on and so on. So look around your house and think of what you want to fill and how you want to decorate. That is your personal style. What I also like to do is mix it up. So, hey, I made a lot of pillows lately. I really wanna put some things in frames right now so that you don't, Feel like you're always making the same thing if that is what you want to do. You, some of us may want all of the same things, but I like to mix it up. I like to have a little bit of dimension in everything I do. So hopefully that will address that question and that concern. But a lot of you, you said you just don't know how to start. That's the first thing you, you want to do is how am I going to start this? Then once you come up with, I'm going to make pillows or I'm going to make this or that or ornaments, use all of the social media outlets that we have available to us. You have Pinterest, you have Instagram, you have FlossTube, you have Facebook, you have all kinds of things. There are magazines, all sources for inspiration. So look through all of that. 
But just like with anything else, don't overwhelm yourself. Don't look and look and look and look for hours and days on end to the point where you then become overwhelmed and you think, I can't do this. Limit yourself. Say, okay, I found three things I like. I'm gonna try it and do this one. Just just narrow the search. And I tell people this a lot too. And I, my, I remember um, when I was looking for a wedding dress. So this kind of falls under the same category. So when you're shopping for something or when you're looking for something that is important for, to you, whether it's an outfit to a special event or you're wanting to do something or make something, once you've made your decision and you've decided this is how I'm going to do it, don't look back. Don't keep, don't keep looking into it and researching it. You've already done that. Now look forward on I'm going to do this. This is how this is this is what I'm chose. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to wear. This is how I'm going to finish this piece. Because then you'll keep creating that negative self doubt that I can't do it, or maybe there's something better I can do. So pick a plan stick with it and the next time try something different if you think that you want to go and find another way to do it so hopefully that will help with um, getting you started and eliminating some of that fear so use all of the social media and print media that we have at our disposal we live in a wonderful time where we can do that and if you like a certain style or a certain designer start looking in that theme so say you like lizzie kate designs well, then you're looking for more of the primary or the bright colors or the bigger embellishments. Or if you like a more primitive design, then look for primitive fabrics or, or primitive trims or learn to tea dye or hand tea dye white rick rack to get that color you want. There are many different ways, but first decide what your decorating style is and what technique you want and what look you want to achieve. Okay, so let's see. Don't overthink it. Just don't overthink it. Okay. Um, Let's see, and the next one is centering. So this goes back to having the right tools. And don't worry about things being so mathematically correct because if anyone is in your house with a ruler checking to make sure that you have your piece centered, you probably aren't gonna invite them back to your house. But only you know that. Only you know if it's not perfectly centered or perfectly straight but using the right tools, measuring multiple times before you cut will help. One thing I found with sticky board and putting things on a board, a lot of you said you worried about things being um, shifting. It's going to happen. If it does, it's okay. But um, lay your piece down, like what I do. So say I have a flat piece. And again, we're gonna show these things in some of my tutorials. But when I did this piece, so this is a box I had and I finished this little pillow topper to put inside the box. It's not perfectly straight, but I learned that I've, this I made probably six years ago. I know how to keep from doing this again, but lay it right up. If you get something close enough to the edge, lay it on top and you're lacing it or pinning it around, it'll help you center it. You can also use the spray tacky glue um, it's, it's very lightweight. You can spray it and kind of, it helps you keep it in place, but you can move it if you need to. Um, try that. You can also, if you are working with sticky board, so say this is your stitched piece right here, and this is your sticky board. Line up the bottom of the sticky board where you want it to, to rest and just lay it down. And that gives you that straight line. The, the other beautiful thing about sticky board and these little tacky spray, if you need to peel it off or reposition it, you can. Um, and also, that's another reason I like to sometimes put quilt batting on it so that I am not laying my, my stitch piece right on the sticky board. So if I need to reposition it, I'm not pulling it and pulling it and pulling it off. That's also why a lot of people like mat board and comic board because you don't have too much sticky um, on it so you can reposition it but don't worry about things being perfect. It is okay. Okay. Um, okay. So flat pieces and bulky glue. A lot of you said that you were concerned with um, the, the using the adhesives and using the glue. Well, my two videos ago, we talked about how I discovered the Eileen's glue. And this is, this is Eileen's tacky glue and this is the spray glue. And these are wonderful for fabric and for cross stitch pieces. Um, it's very um, safe for your products, uh, for, your, for your projects. But with this glue, again, I'm gonna show you how to use these in upcoming videos. It's more, um, it, it's just, you can mold it, you can blend it, you can smooth it. Hot glue 
what I found um, is it's great for a thicker fabric. Um, it, it, with the thinner fabric, you, it, we don't run into these problems as much, but with the Eileen's glue, it lays smoother. The hot glue wants to dry thicker. The Eileen's glue dries smoother, clearer, and easier to, to work with. So, um, what I also found is with the hot glue, when you, when you use it on any kind of paper board, so either a sticky board or a cardboard or a mat board, it wants to wobble and wave. So that is where that fear is. So once we find these products that we feel like works for us, then we hopefully will address those issues. I know Vonna Pfeiffer uses the Eileen's glue. I, I have watched many of her videos where she has used that. While I'm thinking of this, another thing back to, to organization, and if you don't have a lot of space, this is something I have, and I got this, we moved um, in April or March to where we are living now from our home of 20 years, where I used to have a bedroom for a limited time that was my sewing room. Now I have a little loft space. I don't have a lot of space, but one thing I got when we moved here, and I'm gonna try to pick this up, is I got one of these little tiered trays and it's on wheels so you can wheel wheel it around um but one 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 shelf on here i have all of my tacky glue and other glue the next one i have my hot glue and the bottom i have like i have um, my button cover mold i have my thread i use for um cinching and making round pieces um i have floral wire down there tape all kinds of things so this is another great way of organizing your finishing or anything. It, I also had one in my other house, one by my sewing table, and that's where I kept my pins, my safety pins, my straight pins, my tools I needed for my sewing machine, all those things. So just get creative with all of it. Um, okay, indecisiveness. Um, that goes back to don't overthink it. A lot of you said that you were just indecisive. You go to a store to find things to finish and you just get overwhelmed with all the choices. So that falls under the category of keep it small. You know, don't feel like you have to go and buy everything all at once. Start with one project, start with one season, just keep it small. Um, don't overwhelm yourself with too many choices. Um, limit it just to a few things. Uh, let's see. So I think that answers the bulk of those. Nope, hang on, we're still going. Uh -huh. um, okay lack of confidence. A lot of you said you just have lack of confidence. So practicing and, and practice with scrap fabrics. Practice with scrap. Um, and when I say fabric, I mean quilting fabric or whatever fabric you're using, but also with your with a, a scrap piece of um, stitching fabric. So if whatever is, so say, you know, we all have scrap pieces left over. So say you have a, a four by four square that is at the at the bottom of your piece that you just finished and you've cut it off. Well, practice with that piece before you start on something else. So you're not messing up or ruining your stitched piece. Um, some people say that they have poor eyes for design and limited skills and finishing. That just all falls under that same category. Um, and okay, thinking about what to do with your finish. Okay, someone said, I am just a perfectionist. And I've said this before, I've said it today, um, don't be a perfectionist. Your, your pieces, no matter how beautiful they are, they will not be in a museum. Um, you don't have to worry about them being perfect. You are the one who thinks they need to be perfect. Everyone else thinks they're, they're wonderful, beautiful, and fabulous. So stop thinking it needs to be perfect because it will not be perfect. Um, and that is okay. It, it will be close to perfect, I guarantee you. But don't worry about things being perfect. Um, okay, so here are some suggestions that I have. Um, a lot of these I just talked about. Okay, I'm going to show you some things that I have finished, and then hopefully this will talk us through some of our concerns. Um, and I told you my pieces are not perfect. I don't have a lot, and you know, everything here, um, but I do have some things on hand that I want to show you, and I will point out my mistakes just because I want you to see it happens. So I have pulled down a good selection of things. I have flat folds, I have, um, not flat folds, I have flat finishes, I have pillows, I have framed pieces. So 
This is a pillow that I finished. Um, this is the first time that I attached rickrack, hand stitched it to the pillow. I watched a video online and I just practiced. So I had already learned how to make a pillow and then I learned how to attach the rickrack. And I was very happy with how this turned out. Someone mentioned that they um, they know how to make pillows. They just don't like doing the whip stitch to finish the um, pillow, and they don't want to cut the fabric in the back and stitch it. Um, a lot of people cut the fabric in the back, stuff the pillow, and then and then hand stitch the the cut on the back or cover it with something. Um, this particular person says she did not like doing that. And this and I don't. This is the way I prefer to do it. So what I do is I always put it. If I'm making an ornament, I do the the I whip stitch it at the top so I can hide it with however I'm attaching the ornament. If it's a pillow like this that I'm putting on my shelf or in a bowl or in a basket, I will hide it on the bottom and then hide it with the trim, and hopefully it hides my my stitching because I don't have the best looking whip stitch. So this is one pillow finish. Um, I showed y'all this. I made this in a class um, at a retreat once, and this is a lacing, um, was a lacing class. So I learned how to make the, um, the puffiness of the, the, the piece, and we laced the back and then covered it with a piece of wool. And I made this in 2017. Actually, I think I made it in 2016, but I dated it 17. So that is this finish. Lacing will go over. I know Elizabeth Ann Can Stitch has a great tutorial on lacing bigger pieces for framing. Um, that is a technique that a lot of people like to do because you're not using any type of glue or adhesive. If you are lacing your pieces. I have laced this piece. This is something I made for gray. This goes on top of this box. Oops, sorry. This is a jewelry box. And so I stitched this to go on top of this jewelry box. I laced this onto here. So no glue was involved. It was just lacing. Now, when I picked this piece, um, I knew I wanted to find her a top to go on a jewelry box. So I figured out the measurements, I figured out the dimensions and went from there. Um, this uh, was fun to do, but this was all lacing. And then, um, one maybe one video I will do um, like a field trip. We'll go, and I went to Hobby Lobby yesterday just just to see what they had. Um, I knew that they were putting out their Christmas things. I got a couple of Christmas ribbons and picks, um, but I just go and I get a few little things, a few things at a time. I don't want to wait and do it all at once because one, it's it, I don't want to spend all that money at one time, but. Um, it's good to have a good selection because, you know, you may want to stitch some Christmas in July and you want to make sure you have a decent stash then. But this is another thing. So somebody going back to the person who said, I don't know what I want to do with a piece, just knowing what I want to do with the piece. Well, I decided I always knew I wanted to stitch henpeck this, um, these roosters. And I knew I wanted it to, I knew I wanted a patriotic piece. Well, I happened to see this at a antique store. It's not an antique, but I happen to see this at an antique store. And I, I think it's supposed to be hung like this. I really still can't figure out what this thing is, but it has hooks here. So I think you hang it on your wall and you hang a tea towel here or something. I don't know, but I think it looks like a cheese grater to me. So I use this, um, in my kitchen for this piece in the summertime. And I don't always worry about things being interchangeable, but this one I did because I wanted this to be in the kitchen for multiple things. So I did the flat fold, on, not flat fold, the flat finish on this and I had patriotic ribbon and I put a magnet on it. And then I switched this out at Christmas time with my plum pudding mice. So, so I also put my plum pudding mice on a antique muffin tin. So you have choices, but just be creative when you're looking, if you're shopping somewhere and you're like, oh, that's that's unique. But I think what would be the best is um, if you just take something with you or go with something in mind. But I I now know that I see things, when I see something, I think, oh, I, I will definitely use that um, for finishing. Um, this is a, my first frame piece. 
Um, I have a long way to go on framing things. Um, I messed up on this one a lot, and but that's okay. I It was a learning process, and the reason I felt like it was okay for me to practice on this piece is because when I was stitching it, I made a lot of mistakes in the stitching. So I felt like even though I was still proud of this stitched piece, I felt like it was a good piece to practice finishing a frame piece on my own to see if I could do it. So this is what I did. So this one, and I'm, I'm holding it like this so you don't see the glare, but it is not even, it is not straight. And, um, and, and yes, I know you can tell and I can tell, but that's okay. Um, I still love having it out. It's still wonderful. I'm not embarrassed of it. So, but this is, was my first attempt at framing something on my own. I love that piece. This one is a frame I found at Hobby Lobby. So check your, check your thrift stores, check your um, Hobby Lobby's places like that, check their clearance section. This one I got, uh, I can, I, I peeled the, um, the clearance sticker off, but it was, I think $4.99. So this is my piece I stitched and put into this frame. Um, so I did not, when I bought this frame, I did not have a plan for it. So sometimes you don't have to know, but you just think for $4 for a frame, I know I'll need it at some point. Um, this was a gift. So my friend stitched this for me and um, she makes these wooden boards. This is from Stitch Etc. But she stitched this piece for me and sent it to me to finish it. So with this one, I knew I wanted it to be springy. I knew I wanted it to be bright and colorful. I love blue. Um, I had rickrack and buttons and I wanted it on a board. So, because I had, at the time, I was, I was thinking I have enough pillow finishes. I want this one on a board. So I kind of play around with it like that. If I know I have a lot of um, boards or pillows, I kind of mix it up. So, and I added buttons to it. Um, I did not know how I was going to finish it. I didn't know I was going to put buttons on it until I was in the process but I had these buttons in my stash and it dawned on me that they were the same color. So I pulled them out and played with them and put them on. A lot of it is just playing around. And what I do is I lay things around before I glue them. So I'll place them on things, make sure I like it, and then I glue it. Once you glue it, once you put it on, once you're done, stop thinking about it. Because once you obsess about it, then you'll never be happy. I promise you, once you just glue it and walk away, you'll be okay. So this is one of my favorite finishes that I ever did. Um, this is uh, finished on a stitch, etc. board. I mounted it on a sticky board. I hand dyed this trim and I didn't know this is how I was gonna finish it. I had this ribbon, this measuring tape ribbon, you can get at Hobby Lobby. It's white. I soaked it in coffee until I got it a little grungy looking. And then I scrunched it up and layered it in between the pieces. I had a vintage tomato I plopped on the top and that is all I did. Um, sometimes when you're finishing, just just pull and pick and play and place and see, see how it looks, see how you feel about it and go from there. Um, I didn't know how I was gonna do that. And sometimes I go to finish something and I don't have everything I need. Like, I, I may not have the right rickrack that I want. So I'm gonna pull something else. I'm not gonna let it delay me and worry me so much that it's gonna keep me from getting it done. Um, now, if it's something critical and crucial, then yes, I'll wait, but I'm not gonna obsess over not having absolutely every single thing. Um, a lot of you have watched me recently. You've seen these finishes. This is a finish that I did on top of a box. You can get creative with your finishing. Um, this round was one of my first rounds I did. Um, I showed you another round a couple of weeks ago, a Christmas round. This is the summer in the round. Um, the, the one I finished the other day, the Christmas one is different. I zoomed it in a little bit more. I don't have as much as a border. Um, I layered the, the, um, boards behind it to get some fabric, but I'm definitely this next time I'm cutting with a circle cutter. I had, those were on sale the other day and I had a gift card, so I got them. So here's my last piece I'm gonna show you today. Um, you'll see more as Christmas comes out. You'll see more 
um, as Thanksgiving and, and Halloween come around, they're just all in storage right now. So this is Pierre. Y'all saw me stitch him this summer. You can see he's wavy. And we talked about this in that video about how much it bothered me that it was wavy. Um, and I learned from my mistake. I put interfacing on him. I shouldn't have done that. That's interfacing. I have finally convinced myself to stop using interfacing all the time. Interfacing is just used for pillows. It's not used for your flat fold finishes. Um, so that was mistake number one. Another mistake is I did not um, put quilt batting between him and so I couldn't play around with it as much. I used too much hot glue. He got really bulky. So that is okay. It is okay that he is not perfect. But I learned from this mistake. If I had not tried, I would not have learned from it and therefore I wouldn't know what to do next time. So these are all of those types of things that we just learn through the process of doing it. So I hope this has helped you all. There are many more questions that I could not get to. Um, like I said, we had almost 700, but those were the most reoccurring thoughts and questions and concerns and, that you all had. Um, I did not gather all of these supplies overnight. This is years of me just collecting stash, but I know when, when I, I am not a shopper, it is not my favorite thing to do. So chunk it out piece by piece. If today you, you're in the mood to go shopping or you only have time to do one thing or a budget to do one thing, pick one thing. So today I'm gonna to focus on getting ribbon. So go and just get your ribbon, build up your ribbon stash, or today's the day I'm gonna go and build up my fabric stash. So chunk it out like that or do it by holiday. So, or whatever you're stitching. Today I'm just getting fabric to go with this type of theme. So spread it out, give yourself some grace. Don't try to do it all at one time. Um, and don't um, get frustrated with yourself. But hopefully you have found a few suggestions to make this process more fun, more enjoyable, and um, we will start our tutorials coming up here in the next few days of different types of finishing techniques, stitching, things like that. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to email me. My email is thepropersticher at gmail.com. You can also leave me comments below. You can also follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. And I have a blog. I am working on adding more tutorial and more ideas onto that blog. But until then, just don't worry about things being perfect. Just have fun with it. And I'll see you next Thursday.